So when it comes to life expectancy, do you think that AI can revolutionize healthcare and improve treatment standards in order to extend our longe longevi longevi longevity? Sorry. And if so, will you invest in such a project? Doug? I'm really optimistic about that. There's, there's fantastic work going on around the world um, about lifespan and about longevity. And I think there are um, impacts that AI will have on that research that will accelerate how scientists do their job. Toby talked about the fact that, you know, over the last 20 years, we've got um, much, much more efficient in the way we sequence DNA. It's gone from something like $3 billion to do the first genome in the year 2000 to a point now where we could do a cheek swab and we could have our sequence of our genomes overnight for a few hundred dollars. Being able to understand what that information means, not just in one genome, but in millions of genomes that have been sequenced, and to be able to correlate that with important traits like longevity, I think is where AI is going to kick in and help us. And, and we've seen that in so many different, in dif different ways. Um, there are some wonderful examples now where patients have their genome sequenced. They may have an illness, and what we're trying to do is to attribute one of the changes in their genome, one of the mutations or polymorphisms that they have to that illness. Mm -hmm. And AI has helped us do that tremendously. And that then allows a personalization of that individual's therapy. So I think there's going to be remarkable breakthroughs, breakthroughs that we haven't even dreamed about mm -hmm. because of the role and, and the tools that AI give us. So Toby, we're gonna to be living forever. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure that we're going to be living forever, but I hope we're going to be living for longer, and those years will be healthier, healthier. years. Yep. I mean, that's important not just to extend life, but to extend healthy life. Um, there's, um, there's a lovely quote um, to attributed to Hal Varian, who's the chief economist at Google, which is, uh, says, if you want to understand the future, think what rich people have today. Well, rich people have personal physicians who look after them 24-7. You're going to have a smartwatch that monitors you 24, monitors your blood sugar, your heartbeat, your blood pressure, um, and in real time will be able to diagnose things and say, Toby, time to go and see the, the, the heart doctor. You know, there's a slight rumor, murmur that's happened. Uh, and save you an unnecessary, untimely death. So, so, <laughs> this is... Is this...? This is, well, you know, sometimes we're a little bit in fantasy land because we omit the part about the rich people, right? Yes. This, this yes. is, this is, said, this is, you've got like, to be careful because, because people. average people or working class people aren't necessarily going to be able to afford the $1,500 Apple Watch to do the monitoring, right? I think that the intersection here that matters a lot is the idea that um, life expectancy and health will certainly be impacted in a positive way for rich people. And I'd as long as, <laughs> until we deal with, until we deal with... The society thing you were well, talking about. Until we, until we deal with poverty as an issue and the social impacts on uh, the, the decision-making, uh, drug abuse, things like this, that, that are often associated, mm. strongly correlated with poverty. Until we d deal with that as a population, we're not going to see longevity. I, again, that's, that's not a technological problem. That's right. And ever since we've invented medicine, uh, life expectancy right. has been correlated strongly with wealth. Um, and we've never, you know, this technology is just so, amplifying that. So, so this is why I want to actually. So, no, this is why I want to dispel the notion that AI is suddenly going to fix everything. There is no, 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 until no. we. It's going to make it more accessible. Uh, it, I think is the point. It gives the opportunity. Oh, it is. No, he's saying that it's not the point. It gives us the opportunity <laughs> if if we choose as a society to make the choices to ensure that those benefits he, okay, are spread I'll, around. I'll decode. You're saying it will just be another thing that continues the things we see. Uh, and it will make things better for the people who have access. Right. And everything always improves for them anyway, right? Yes, basically. Am I right? Basically. You think, Rad? I think that access is going to become easier because these technologies are going to develop, become cheaper. Like, even if you were, for example, you're talking about smartwatches, when they first came out, yes, incredibly expensive, but now you're getting cheaper and cheaper iterations because the technology is getting better, the manufacturing is getting better, and I think that almost kind of trickle-down um, effect of technology will continue. And Doug, you think? <laughs> I think <laughs> try to work out because there's nuance in your I positions. Think, uh, I think as a nation, we're in a really good position to take advantage of these technologies. We have, I think, it's the second highest life expectancy worldwide. We have a system of social cohesion 
around um, groups like Medi Medicare that enable people that are struggling to access cancer chemotherapy. You know, I've worked for a long time next door to the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. Didn't matter what your background was, you would get world-class cancer care with immunotherapy, the latest technologies. You wouldn't have to mortgage your house or have your kids mortgage their house so that you could get the cancer care. So the technology so that the was developed one was thing. made... Accessible, accessible because of the social decisions we've made as a country mm. that taking care of one another is an important element of that. Katrina? And then I think this is a time when those who are getting advantage from selling tech, like the tech companies <laughs> and other tech companies... That was a low And low. the I mean, government <laughs> make the technology available to those who who may need it or those who may not be able to afford it. So in order to recover from that below the belt hit, <laughs> let me say you, that, that you the look thing, like you're doing fine. The thing that we <laughs> thank you, the thing that we just announced uh, three days ago about our work in quantum technology was that we were making our educational tool called Black Opal, it's like Duolingo for quantum computing, like learn it from nothing, making it freely available to students in TAFEs and historically black colleges and universities in the United States uh, as part of this quad investor network. So I want to just say it is not just like the bad tech bros doing nasty <laughs> things. We are, like many of us, are trying, to, trying hard to improve these issues of access to technology and improving social outcomes. But the one thing I will say again is AI is not magic. And and at least, uh, at least right now, AI does not replace empathy, right? Human empathy is what makes sure these things are